Acts 14, Acts 14, verse number one. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual to the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. The Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. And so Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message by his grace and enabled them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others sided with the apostles. And there was a plan afoot amongst the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and to stone them. They found out about it and fled to the Laconian city of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. They're getting run out of one town and on to the next, but it's very clear they're continuing to do the same thing. They're unfazed. They're going. uh, Different cities, same mission. Different towns, same work. Okay, so on to the next. Verse number eight. They're in Lystra. There sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth. He had never walked. He listened to Paul. Look at this verse, verse number nine. This, I've been thinking about this. I'm not even going to really dive into this today preaching, but it's, I've been thinking about it for two weeks now. Uh, Listen to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw he had faith to be healed. I've just asked the question. I wonder what he saw. Like it's, it's, he, he looked at him, and from looking at him, he saw he had faith to be healed. I don't know about you, but I want faith that can be seen. I don't even, I, again, the scripture doesn't even go beyond what it looked like, but I, I've just been thinking about that, asking God to give me a faith that can be seen. Verse 10, he called out, stand up on your feet, and at that, the man jumped up and he began to walk. The crowd saw what Paul had done. They shouted in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form, and Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because... He and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So they see the miracle and they're like, these are gods. The gods have come to be among us. So they're about to worship Paul and Barnabas and sacrifice uh, bulls in worship of these guys. And uh, they get word of it. It took them a while because they were doing it in a different language. So they didn't really know at first, but then they caught wind of what they were doing. Verse 14, the apostles heard of this. They tore their clothes and rushed to the crowd shouting, men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, humans like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in him. He's being really intentional here in preaching the gospel. Um, when, When he was speaking of people that came up from a Jewish background, when he preached the gospel, he started with the Old Testament. But here he's working with Gentiles that worshiped Greek gods. So he doesn't start with the Old Testament. He starts with, they worship the gods of creation. He's saying, no, that's a worthless God. Our God is, he created all of creation. He's strategic in how he communicates the gospel to who he's speaking to. Verse 17. Yet he has not let himself without testimony. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven, crops in their season, provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. And even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. So they're trying to stop. Like, don't praise us. Stop it. Don't sacrifice to us. But they're having a hard time resisting the crowd. Verse number 19. Some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. A lot of scholars here actually believe he was dead. He was killed and God raised him back to life. The scriptures don't say it would have been very rare for them to stone someone and have them not be killed. This was a very effective way when the crowd wanted someone dead to kill him. So if if he didn't die, he was like dead. They thought he was dead. This was a severe beating he took. But after the disciples gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. Come on, that's some boldness. (laughs) Goes back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Today, I want to preach around this idea, no weapon shall prosper. No weapon shall prosper. Pray this out loud with me together, church. Say, dear God, today, do what no man can do. Open my eyes. Open my heart that I may receive your word, believe your word, and obey your word. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. We are now in a section of the book of Acts, and really for the duration of the book of Acts, on the missionary journeys. The missionary journeys. Paul, the apostles, 
here and throughout the duration of the book are going to travel from town to town, region to region, city to city, on mission, preaching the gospel. And so for the next few months, we're going to be walking through these missionary journeys. And I'm, I'm praying and believing that God's going to ignite a fresh spirit of evangelism in our hearts, a, a fresh spirit of sharing the gospel, of living on mission for the gospel, of proclaiming the good news, of seeing ourselves as ambassadors of Christ. I think about Isaiah 52, verse 7, that says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, Isaiah says, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. That's the apostles. They, 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 it's the beautiful feet of the apostles traveling, bringing about the good news of the gospel, the good news of Christ. And so this is going to be a mini-series within the book of Acts as we finish uh, about the beautiful feet of the apostles bringing the good news. And uh, it's going to take us through Memorial Day finishing the spring through the holiday, looking at this. And then June and July, I'm gonna start a series that I think is gonna be the most important series I've ever preached at our church about family, about family. And so that kind of give you a little bit of idea where we're headed in the next few months. And, uh, but today, Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas go to two cities, okay? They go to two cities, well, really three, but kind of the second two together. The first one in this first section, they go to Iconium. Okay, they're in Iconium, and as per usual, their normal pattern when they went to a city was they began their ministry at the synagogue. They went to the gathering of people uh, that were there to worship, and they began to preach the gospel. And the scriptures tell us they do it so effectively, people believe. How many know it's great? Praise God. People are believing the gospel. People are getting saved in Iconium. And then at the same time, there's those there who don't believe. Very usual, very normal. Even when Jesus proclaimed the ways of the kingdom, there were those that followed and those that came under submission and those that accepted him and those who rejected him. This is, this is the parables, right? There's gonna be some seed that falls on good soil and produces much fruit. There's gonna be some that falls uh, on not good soil, on rock, gets choked out. There's gonna be some that doesn't produce fruit. So this is true of Jesus. It's true of the apostles. When the gospel is preached, some believe, some don't. Now here, the ones that are not believing are not just content to not believe, but they began to, as Acts say, poison the minds of those who begin to believe. So they are actively and intentionally trying to manipulate and poison the minds, pull in their thinking and belief, those who are believing the gospel, away from the message of the gospel and what the apostles are teaching very intently, very directly against the apostles. And so what it's doing, it's creating division. It's creating division. So much so, it says Paul and Barnabas decided to stay for a duration of time. People were being so confused, so deceived, so divided. They said, we have to stay here to continue to bring clarity to the message of Christ because these people are deceiving and poisoning the minds of so many. And so they do that for a duration of time, and then it says they catch wind of a plan to stone them and kill them, and so they leave, okay? They leave. They go to the next city, Lystra. There, they continue to preach the gospel. The first thing the scriptures tell us when they get there is there's this man who's never walked. He's never walked. And as Paul's preaching, he sees he has faith to be healed Paul commands him to get up, and boom, for the first time in his life, we've seen this already in the book of Acts chapter 3, we've seen for the first time in his life, his legs are made strong, and he's walking. And people, of course, and obviously take notice of this. They see it, it's a miracle, they've seen this guy, they know this guy, they know this was miraculous, they know this was supernatural, they know this was divine, and so they think, that it was their Greek pagan gods that did this. They misinterpreted the miracle. So they saw the power of God, but that didn't change their pagan false belief system and false gods, and so they put their false belief system onto the miracle God did. So they see it, and they had a belief that the gods would come to them in human form and do these kinds of things. And so they see them, and they think Paul and Barnabas are Zeus and Hermes. 
They're like, it's the Greek gods. They're here. They're here. Look, they, they've come among us. So much so, they called the priest to bring a bull with a wreath around his neck. That was a great sign of devotion and adoration and worship. They were bringing him into the town to begin to sacrifice animals and worship the men because they thought they were gods. Now, Paul and Barnabas at first didn't know this because it was in the Laconian language, but once they catch wind of it, they see the sacrifice, they see the parade happening, and they're like, time out, time out, time out, stop the parade, uh, don't worship us. Like, we're just men, we're just humans like you. Like, don't, they, they, do not worship us. Uh, we're, we're here proclaiming the good news about the God of all creation. And he begins to tell them about uh, their gods are not the real gods, they're the false gods. The God of all creation is the God that they're bringing and proclaiming and sharing with. He's the God who created all things and he's the one that's worthy of our worship. And it says they had a hard time talking them out of it. Hard time talking them out of it. And at the same time, people are coming in from Antioch, from out of town, and they're once again dividing the people. So much so here where they begin to persecute them. Paul gets stoned, dragged out of the city, left for dead, the next day, the disciples get them up. They go back into the city and begin discipling those who had believed. How many know the roller coaster of emotions and challenges and joys in this chapter is pretty severe? It's like, we're at Iconium. Boom, people are believing because the message is going forth. Awesome. Oh my gosh, there's great division and their minds are being poisoned. Oh my gosh, we're going to disciple them and teach them the ways. And oh my gosh, they're plotting against us to the next city. Oh my gosh, this man has been healed. He's walking for the first time in his life. Oh my gosh, praise God, the power of God. Oh no, don't worship us. We are not the false gods. Don't do that. So call off the parade, send back the bull. Don't do that, right? It's like, look at God and oh no, and look at God and oh no, no and praise God and what's going on, right? Up and down, back and forth, back and forth. Today, today I wanna look at this text and I want to set some spiritual expectations for you. I want to set some spiritual expectations because many frustrations in our lives come out of unrealistic expectations. Here's, here's what frustration is. It's the gap between your expectation and reality. However big that gap is is how frustrated you get. This is why some of you get frustrated at sports because you think your team is actually good. So at the beginning of the season, your expectation is really high. It's really high. You expect this. And then when the reality hits that they're not, this is how frustrated you are. Me being a Minnesota Vikings fan, my expectations are down here. And so when reality is here, I ain't that mad. <laughs> Why? Because the difference between your expectation and reality is your level of frustration. And so, so much of your spiritual frustration can come out of unrealistic spiritual expectations. So I want to give us some things from this text today that can give us spiritual expectation and faith and hope as we follow Christ together. The first thing is this, joys and struggles often come as a package deal. Joys and struggles often come as a package deal. In verse 1 through 7, I want you to look at this. Verses 1 through 7 and 8 through 18. Verses 1 through 7, you've got great division, great division. Minds being poisoned. People turned against each other. And at the same time, in the same place, in the same ministry, in the same people, you've got great discipleship happening. Because people have come to know Christ, and Paul and Barnabas stay, and they're teaching them thoroughly through the gospel. And so, great discipleship, and at the same time, same season, same place, same ministry, great division. Joy and struggle, package deal. Next place, 8 through 18, it's right off the gate, miracles and faith. Wow, look at the man's faith. Wow, God's moving in miracles. Wow, look at the work of God. Look at the power of God. God is dwelling among us. God is making his power known in needs amongst God's people. God is moving. And at the same time, great spiritual deception. Like they're not even worshiping the right God. They're so confused. They've got a pagan secular view of God that they're putting on what God is showing them. So they've got a false belief system. And both are happening at the same time in the same place with the same people in the same ministry. Joys and struggles often come as a package deal. Do I have a witness this morning that so many times in following Christ, much blessing also comes with much burden? 
You just got to know that. Like you're asking for a blessing of God and God will do that, but just know much blessing comes with much burden. Much joy also comes with much sorrow. Much joy also comes with much hardship. Much victory also comes with much toil and struggle. Uh, progress in one area and pushback in another area. I mean, you see this in the life of Jesus. Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry, I love the Gospel of Matthew, articulates this so brilliantly. Matthew chapter number three would be what you could label a mountaintop chapter for Jesus. He is baptized in water by John. The voice of the Father says to him, you are my son, identity, whom I love, affection, with whom I am well pleased, affirmation. So, so before he does a miracle or preaches a sermon, there's a voice from God speaking identity, affirmation, approval. There's crowds there. There's the baptism of water. And Matthew chapter four, verse one, right out of the next chapter, what happens? Into the desert to be tempted by Satan. Chapter three, he's got the voice of the father. Chapter four, he's got the hiss of Satan. Chapter three, he's in the waters of baptism. Chapter four, he's in the fire of temptation. Chapter three, there's crowds and community. Chapter four, there's isolation and temptation. You see in the contrast right here, before Jesus is even beginning his ministry, he's showing us, hey, there are joys and struggles, mountaintops and valleys, trials and temptations. One does not negate the other, but you've gotta know both are a reality. Both are a reality. Every amazing thing God has done in my life at the same season, like me and Anna laugh sometimes to each other. We're like, can we, can we like just have a joyful season sometimes? Like, can we just have a win without there being other losses or struggles or toil? But, but the more we live and the more we follow Jesus and the more we observe the lives of people in the scriptures, joy and struggles are a package deal. They're just a package deal. They, they, they come together with much blessing comes much burden, with much progress comes much pushback. And here's how, because of our humanity, here's how we interpret that in our minds. We can allow the negative to completely dominate and overshadow the positive. <laughs> in our flesh and in our struggle and weakness, we can allow the pushback, we can allow the struggle to completely dominate the progress in what God is doing in our life. Come on, is anybody with me today? You can get a thousand compliments, a thousand of them, a thousand compliments and words of encouragement, and then you get one criticism, and which one are you thinking about all night? Come on. You can, you can, have, you can have hundreds of good days on the job and hundreds of, of, of points of progress and success, and then you can have one failure and one slip back, and which one eats your soul alive? Come on, as a pastor, I get 50 emails and 49 of them are real good and loving and encouragement and one of them isn't. And guess which one I think about more? Right, come on, it's like, it's, it's, it's the struggle, it's the pushback, it's the hardship that in our flesh, if we're not careful, it can overshadow the progress in what God is doing. And so here's what we need to ask God to help us do, ready? Don't allow the pushback to blind you from the progress. Don't allow the pushback to blind you from the progress. How easy would it have been for Paul and Barnabas to leave town and just be like, man, the division there was so great. Man, the struggle there was so great. Man, what are we even doing? I thought we were gonna be welcome there, but they didn't welcome us there. No, 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 they didn't leave focusing on the pushback. They, they left onward for the gospel. Why? Because they knew God is still moving. I know this is a struggle, but God is still moving. I know there was pushback, but God still saved people. I know there was confusion, but God is still discipling people. I know there was division, but God is still bringing unity to his people. There was pushback. There will be pushback. There is struggle. There will always be struggle. But I want to encourage you, God is still moving. God is still moving. God is still working. Don't allow the pushback in your walk with Christ in the struggle to overcome what God is doing. Turn your eyes to the good work of Christ and be encouraged. God is moving. God is moving even in the struggle. God is moving even when it's difficult. Look at what God is doing in your life. Look at what God is doing in our church. Look at what God is doing in our nation. Look what God is doing. God is still moving. But part of the deal is it's gonna be a struggle. It's gonna be a struggle. 
Is that encouraging enough for you today? All right, the next thing is this. Anything you do for the kingdom will come with a fight. Anything you do for the kingdom will come with a fight. No work of significance, and I'm not even talking kingdom here. I'm just anything. No work of significance that you do will ever come easy. If you're looking for easy, then significance is going to leave because anything of significance is going to come with a fight, especially something of eternal significance. Anything of eternal significance will come with a fight. It will not come easy. In fact, the Christian life, it could be described as a battle. The Christian life is a battle. It's a battleground. It's a war zone. The Christian life is a battle. Now, when we talk about salvation, the battle over death, hell, and the grave, that is a battle, praise God, Christ has won for us. That is a battle where we don't fight for victory or strive for victory. We are not righteous by our own doing. We are righteous by the blood Jesus shed on the cross for us. His righteousness, his blood, the cross won the battle for us for salvation. Christ fought that battle and won that battle. We, by faith, believe it and receive it in Jesus' name. Anybody grateful for that? We're not not fighting for that. However, to live a life worthy of that, to live a life worthy, that reflects that and carries that with it, that's a battle. That's a battle that we must fight. And I wish, I wish I had a different message for you this morning. I really do. I wish I had an easier, lighter message for you this morning, but I want to tell the truth and shame the devil this morning. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight. You living for Jesus, you honoring him with your life, you pushing forward the kingdom of God and pushing back darkness, that's going to take a fight. If you want to live righteous in a culture of wickedness, it's going to take a fight. Men, if you want to serve and love and cherish the wife of your youth, that's going to take a fight. Parents, if you want to raise up your children in the ways of the Lord while living in modern day Babylon, how many know that's going to take a fight? If you want to honor God in the workplace as working unto the Lord, that's going to take a fight. If you want to stand on God's word when a secular culture pressures to label you and cancel you for a biblical worldview, that will take a fight. If you want to honor God with your finances and in your generosity in a culture that's selfless and greedy and materialistic, that's going to take you fighting. If you want to build the church of Jesus Christ in a culture where it's popular to criticize it and tear it down, how many know that's going to take a fight? If you want to live honestly and live with integrity when everyone around you is lying and cheating their way to the top, it's going to take a fight. If you want to keep your mind in perfect peace in a world full of confusion and chaos, how many know it's going to take a fight? Everything you do for the kingdom of God will be a fight. It'll be a fight. So we pick up our spiritual weapons and we square up against the enemy. We put on the armor of God and get ready for battle because taking ground for the kingdom takes a fight. So we don't crumble at resistance. We expect resistance. I'm not surprised by resistance. I expect resistance because I know this is a fight. I know the enemy doesn't just concede territory. I know the enemy pushes back when the kingdom of God takes ground. And this is all over the scripture. James chapter four, verse seven says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's an active, resist it, push back. It's gonna take some fight. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. First Peter five, eight and nine, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Hear those words, roaring lion, devour. Verse number nine, what must we, what, how, how must we respond? Peter says, resist him, resist him, fight against him. Stand firm in the faith because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of suffering. He's like, hey, the enemy, the enemy's not a kitten coming to cuddle. He's a lion coming to kill. He's coming to kill. If he was a kitten, I think it'd be just as worse. That's more like the, the, the devil, in my opinion, <laughs> coming as a cat. But he's, he's a lion. He's coming to kill. He is mean. He is vicious. Stand firm. Resist him. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11 Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can stand against the devil's schemes. You guys hearing the the theme and the trend? Resist him. Stand firm against him, against the devil's schemes. 
part of the character and the nature of God, you've got to get this, because, you know, people will say, oh, Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God. He's a cuddly little cute little lamb. He, only, only nice fluffy flowers and things. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God. He's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's also a fighter, a warrior. He, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and, and he, he's the lion and he's the lamb. And so today, I want you to get your fight back. I want you to get your fight back. If you're a Christian and you've just been on cruise control, I want you to get your fight back today. If you've been so casual, thinking that you can casually cruise control in this thing and push back darkness, you, you are mistaken. We gotta get our fight back. We gotta arm ourselves with the spiritual weapons God has given us, put on the full armor of God, pull out the weapon of prayer once again and fight. Pull out the weapon of fasting once again and fight. Pull out the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and fight. Christians are people who fight, who stand firm. We don't fight against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against people. Our fight is not in the natural. Our fight is in the supernatural. It's in the spiritual. We wage war on the enemy. Our battle is not with people. It's with principalities. Stand firm. Fight. It's going to be a fight. It's going to be a fight. I don't want you to be deceived and think that your journey with Christ is not gonna involve warfare. It's not gonna involve a battle. It's gonna involve a fight everywhere, and we'll see this as we look through the missionary journeys. Everywhere they go, there's resistance. Everywhere they go, there's a fight. But we're also encouraged by this. This is the next thing, that God's power is sufficient to win spiritual battles. So it's a fight, but I'm really grateful I don't have to fight on my own. Really grateful I don't fight with my own strength and my own power. I fight spiritual battles with spiritual help from God. I don't fight with my own power. I fight with God's power. I don't fight on my own agenda or my own plan. I, I fight for God's agenda and God's word and God's heart and God's plan. I don't do this thing alone. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says this, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Come on, that's it. What a verse right there. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. You're not fighting alone. How about Isaiah 54? He says, no weapon formed against you will prevail. You'll refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. He said, hey, there's going to be weapons formed. They're not going to prosper. When the enemy comes in like a flood, I'll raise up a standard. I'll fight with you. I'll fight for you. My spirit is in you. My word is behind you. His sovereignty is over us. God helps us fight spiritual battles. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. We don't fight like the world. Verse four, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Again, we're in spiritual battles. We're fighting spiritual things. And Paul says, hey, we've got weapons to pull down strongholds in the spiritual. We've got weapons from God, equipped by God, to win spiritual battles that we are in because it's a fight and look if you try to fight spiritual battles in natural ways you're gonna lose i want to say that again this isn't even on my notes but i just feel this this morning if you're trying to fight spiritual battles in natural ways you're gonna lose and you're gonna lose weary you're gonna lose burdened you're gonna lose tired you're gonna lose discouraged why because you you can't win spiritual battles in natural ways you can't solve spiritual problems without spiritual solutions. So we wage war in the spiritual, and God helps us with spiritual weapons and spiritual power to do what he's called us to do. Amen? A phrase that I found this week when I was studying for this, Pastor John Piper came up with this, and this just really ministered to me. And I want to close here this morning, and I want it to minister to you I think it really applies to Acts chapter 14. Pastor John Piper talks about this idea. He calls it grace denied, grace supplied. Grace denied, grace supplied. What does that mean? Well, there are times in battles that we go in in our life where we're praying for God's grace to be upon them. 
right? I think about Acts chapter 14. Hey, we're going to Iconium. We're going to Lystra. We're going to Derby. Lord, protect us. Lord, be over us. Lord, right? We, we pray for success. We pray for protection. We pray for health. That's what the church prayed for over the apostles and everybody being sent out. But what often happens is, and this is a story right here, Lord, protect us. Lord, keep us from harm. And they go into Lystra and grace denied. <laughs> Stone nearly to death. Come on, anybody ever had that season? Lord, I'm praying for a good report. God, I'm praying for full health. And the report comes back, grace denied. Lord, I'm praying for a smooth transition into this job. Lord, I'm praying for your hand in this season. God, I need direction. Lord, thank God you opened this door. May this be the door you have and you walk through it and it is not grace denied. If you could just picture a big circle with me in scenarios in your life and at the top of that circle, you could say grace denied. How many of our situations and scenarios in life were just like grace denied? But here's, here's the good news this morning. I want to encourage you. Inside of the circle of grace denied, there's another circle that's labeled grace supplied. So, God, I didn't want to be here. God, I didn't think this would happen. But in the midst of here, you have supplied everything I've needed. In the midst of this persecution, God, you have sustained me. God, in the midst of this bad health report, you've transformed me from the inside out and proved yourself in ways I would have never seen. God, in the midst of grace denied, your grace has supplied everything that I've needed. This is gonna be so much of your Christian life. I'm trying to put some language to it to encourage you when you're discouraged because grace has been denied in your life to look for with spiritual eyes where God is supplying grace in the midst of that season. He's doing it. He's doing it. He's doing it. Man, I think about the story of our church. 2018 and 2019, we moved up here to the north side in 2018, planted in 2019, and I had dreams and visions and plans for the first 24 months of our church. Here's what God was going to do. Here's what it was going to look like. The first 24 months of our church, I was believing for things. I was planning for things. We, we had put stuff in place for things. We, I was as studied and thorough and thought out as anybody. I'll take you to the bank on it. I was believing God and God and God and God. And 26 weeks into our church, we're kicked out of the high school in the pandemic and shut down and grace was denied. <laughs> grace was denied. Over the course of the next six months, I'm getting texts from every other church planner we went through training with all over the country that's closing shop and shutting their church down because they couldn't make it, and we're trying to find a place to meet through the end of 2020, and grace felt denied, and we finally got a, um, the keys to this place for a lease in the fall of 2020, and we thought we could get in for $100,000 and get it ready in just a few months. <laughs> and grace was denied. <laughs> it cost twice as much and took twice as long and took, it just grace was denied. But in the midst of the shutdowns and the school and the move and the construction and the in and out, in the middle of grace denied, what has God done? There's been grace supplied for what he had. There's been things God has done in our church and worked in me and worked in our team and done and proved himself in ways and ways I could have never imagined. And I'm grateful that grace was denied because I've gotten to taste the goodness of God supplying a fresh grace and a new grace that I could have never prayed for. I would have never asked for it, but he's been faithful to equip me and equip us with what we've needed as we've struggled and won, and struggled, and won, and struggled, and won. And I'm telling you, it's the same for you. God's grace and God's power is sufficient for your weakness. He can help you fight battles you don't even know you're going to have to fight. He is enough in Jesus' name. At the end of this text, they leave town, verse 26, from Italia, they sailed back to Antioch. And then look at this. So <laughs> dude's literally been nearly beaten to death. He's faced all kinds of setbacks, struggles, hardships, and he's on to the next town, and look what it says. Where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had completed. Like, what is his testimony? Where is his anchor as he's leaving town half dead, having faced struggles? Not like, oh, goodness, praise God, we got out of there. Oh, my gosh, can you believe that? Wow, what pushback. No, no, no. They leave there saying, committed to the grace of God for that work. What is that? Grace supplied. 
Man, they, they had tons of grace denied. But Paul and Barnabas knew grace supplied. Grace supplied here. Because he supplied it, on to the next. Let's go. Because he supplied it, we're going to carry on. We're going to keep fighting the good fight. We're going to keep the faith in Jesus' name. Amen? Stand to your feet all over the room this morning, church. I want to pray. We're going to spend some time in reflection and in worship here this morning. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit what he's saying to you. We're going to sing and worship. The altars are open for prayer. We've got communion on the sides for those that are followers of Christ. If you want to take this morning. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you're supplying fresh grace for every person in the room for the season that's before us. Lord, so many of us are facing so many struggles and trials today. Lord, I pray for my brother and sister today that's weary and downcast and struggling and tired. Lord, I pray today fresh grace, fresh grace supplied for this season. Lord, I pray for those who have lost their fight. Lord, they've lost their fight. They've put their spiritual weapons down. They've gotten casual, they're on cruise control. Lord, I pray today by your spirit, you would awaken, Lord, a fresh spirit to fight once again, to get back up once again, Lord, to walk in all that you'd have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen.